Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. You're listening to Trace Elements Radio, and I am live on Revolution Radio Studio A, and of course, Trace Elements Radio. We're going to do two things, or at least attempt to do two things today. Answer a question. You know, I've been talking about the ancient stories and how they do directly relate to the stories that are from um, Europe, all over Europe, from the far north to the east, to the west, to the south, to the islands, and over here. So you guys ask that question, and please, if you have anything that you'd like me to look into, go to Trace Elements Radio. Dot com, and on the left hand side there's a contact form and I will try my best also there's been some cataclysmic weather events geological events sinkholes um, new creatures the devastation of the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean this will be for the second half and perhaps why some of you can hear the hums. It's happening all over the world, of course. But again, only certain of us can hear it. Also, there's a sudden rash of suicides, unfortunately. Especially in the far north, but in the big circle of the north. So we're going to get into all of this today. First, to answer the question of the Merovingians and bring it to words used all over the world. Um, I do have this bit written down on my page. So, you can look there if you need to look up the names again. I um, absolutely suggest that you do that. So I am going to put this up in the room in case you want to follow with me or look look it up later so you can see these names, how they're spelled. Their sounds would have been different depending on the time they were used. So, it starts like this. Anu's father was Asher. Marduk was called Asur or Ra, the grandfather of Osiris, who himself was also called Ashur, with a U instead of an E this time, or Asar, as, then changed to, well, A-S changed to A-R. It means seeing lord, or naga, or dragon, a merlin, or a druidy. Druid he. That's the oldest term word for it. Now these and their variants, including the Norse A E S I R Asur and the Gaelic Scythian so Arian as or as Dan still means he who sees. Ash sure, he who sees, and again, Ashur, seeing Lord. From the segment six of the Assyrian clay tablet, formed as a disc of eight segments, copied from an earlier Sumerian original. You can see how words change because, you know, maybe it was written down wrong, some got smudged. But these names were definitely carried from one place to another. So, eight, eight segments. Escalated, well, excavated from the ruins of the Royal Library at Nineveh, which is the very foundation and the meaning of the Greek word Turkish Thea, from whence we get or at least derive the word dragon. 
in Arian Samuel or Ahura Ashura Mazda is called Tavitsky or Tav Ash Tree and rumor has it that he, the elder brother, actually sired Indra, who began the pantheon. It's streamlined anyway. Turns out to be D.S. Pater, which has certain ramifications when converted to the Sumerian, because Tavistra, the fashioner, converts as we have seen to Anki, Ninimud, the craftsman, whose brother isn't Ninurta, Indra, but Dias Pater, or Enlil. The conflict between Anki and Enlil, therefore, might have been more deep-seated than first we realize because it may not have been just a simple rivalry between two brothers but the rivalry between a father Enki and his forbidden brother son Enlil such a conflict was played out between Zeus and Kronos who led a rebellion of the Titans against Uranus, but also between Zeus and Prometheus. In Arian, so again this is ancient Scythian, the Ashuras, also called the Devas, meaning shining ones, and this epithet also becomes applied to both the members of the Anunnaki, and later the fairies who descended from them. Earlier scholarly sources have the name Anunnaki translated as Anunnaki, meaning still shining ones. And here we have the relationship between the Vedic Nagas and then Anunnaki. Nagas and Anaki. So, the Sumerian Chronicles. We learn that the children of Anu were the Anunnaki who decreed the fates, meaning that they themselves were also the Mori or the Fata or the fairies, the scale armored um, leprechauns the dragon kings who in the Aryan Vedas appear alongside their divine companions and are referred to as the Nagas who became the snake deities of India who guard the submerged, submerged treasure echoing again the central theme of the grail and the ring cycles now the grail and the lake represent the womb, the magic ring hidden in the lake, and the red gold flow that is mentioned, and the dew of the grail, both represent the life-giving blood and the mummy, later mermaid, the submerged or hidden treasure of the serpent tailed, and the swan winged mermaids, the Nega goddesses of the north, whose vulvae or double-ended tails and wings are also to be found in all the representations of the ancient, ancient Ashur, A-E-S-I-R, the Titan or the Elder God the Typhoon, Typhon, son of Gaia and Tartarus, whose other children 
included vampir vampiric limas, the mermaids, or the nannies, nanades, whose name is closely associated with Tartara in Transylvania, the original home of the dragon queens and the dragon kings. Titan, by the way, derives from Sumerian Titi An, which means the breath of life of Anu, sons of Anu, the Nephilim, and the spirits of the stars, or the star people, as we call them here on this continent. So 7,000 years after this contest between Typhon and Zeus, Typhon's fairy descendants, Egrain, usually spelt with a Y, or at first it was, Egrain, Morgana, and Melusine are still portrayed in medieval churches in architecture with his wings and his temple and a tail. And the depiction of Melusine with those physical attributes appears as a supporter in the arms usually of the imperial and the royal house of Ver V-E-R-E -E. In Typhon as a dragon god we remember Odin who himself often portrayed as a dragon or serpent Anega and that he too was an Asher or Acer an Acer like the computers that's where they get that name Acer so a member of the old warlike order of the gods Odin is also or usually associated with um, how would we even say it Idrasil or Idrarad, ASL, um, the word, the world ash of the North, Norse. And here we remember that the tree's name, because we've talked about Asher before, the steed of Egod or Odin was a goddess who performed the same function as the queens of Avalon. As a serpent, he is seen entwined around the Eos tree, or the yew tree, later became the yew log, or the yod. That's why we have that at Christmas. So it echoes the depiction of Samuel, the serpent, which was N-H S-H because well they didn't use vowels basically so it's entwined in Lilith's branches it's still a tree so subtext here is the nega so at this juncture we must break off and study the Aryan nega the serpent divas the daemons, the guardians of the treasure, hidden in the water still. We do this by first looking at the Hebrew, the Hebrew word Nahash. This word means serpent, thus dragon, derives from the root word N-H-S-H. -H. It's, it's a snake pretty much still the snake in English. So, Hebrew Kabbalah, and particularly and rather strangely, in relationship to the Jewish practice of divination by birds, or Oni Oniothomancy, the serpent, or the Nahash, 
is one who discovers hidden secrets or the wisdom from the raven used here a lot too or the dove or the swan and you can look this up this is Warburg Lectures and University of London private dissertation on Kabbalah and Jewish ornithal ornithomancy 1996 so the NHSH is still Enki Samuel or Sir Hermash which is Capricorn goat-headed sea serpent or Alu Lim Ram of the Glittering or the Shining Ones as in Alvin Waters it's associated with Lilith or the Quadoth the Quiddith Quidditch used you know in in the later transfigured mythology of you know Harry Potter or the abyss the absu which is watery depths it is a lake it is a well it is a vulva so closely associated with the relationship between Lilith and Samuel as I said before these are just the raven and the dove as birds of divination in this context it becomes clear that these Kabbalistic symbolic animals are meant to represent the Valkyries the Morganas the Magdalas Magdalenes the Ishtar priestesses who are the maidens maidens of the ring maidens of the grail the dove specifically the turtle dove or the Barbary dove is a soft brown color and has a ring around its neck it lies open at the throat like a necklace this dove specifically sacred to Venus in every religion that worship Venus is a symbol of love and devotion the bird referred to in even the name Mary Magdalene or Magdal or Magdal it still means dove so the ring around its neck is a torque which in Gaelic lore symbolizes as to all rings kingship and therefore wisdom seership the Dirks Thea or the dragon nature that Mary is named Magdalene of the place of the doves which is sacred to Venus thus Ishtar also Hathor means that she Mary was a priestess of this goddess of love now the link between the raven known as the phoenix the dove and Samuel is alchemical at one level the raven and the dove are female and interchangeable the dove or doves in Magdal the place of the doves or the temple of the priestess of Ishtar Hathor Venus being the priestesses a priestess of Ishtar the other the raven being the priestess of Morrigan the cabal or Kabbalah specifically says that the raven and the dove are the same bird and in the northern hemisphere the brown singing ravens of the druids are obviously the turtle doves or priestesses the brown morgans equivalent to swan maidens Samuel in his congress with them obtaining the wisdom of the 
Kabbalas, or the abyss, the waters of the deep. Still, the Barbary Dove, or the Migdal, links the ring circle to Mary Magdalene, and hence Jesus. Both then are linked back to Hathor and the raven goddesses of the Druids, to Anne and the phoenix of the Scythians, hence the ring and the dragon Orobus, called Janus by the Phoenicians, and Jor Mungar by the Danes. Like Enki and Kem, Siva is the woad painted Lord of the Goats. Jormangar, the Earth Spanner, the Encircler, the Vala of the Vedas, lives in the watery depths, and once upon a time, a long time, long, long ago, Thor and the giant Titan, Hymir, went fishing for him. As bait they used an ox head, which, as we've seen many times, symbolizes ovaries, fallopian tombs, womb, vagina of the virgin goddess. Here again, we, a link between the water, Samuel the dragon, and the virgins. The brown raven, or the coral priestesses of the druidic cult, cult, if you will, is the turtle dove and the swan maiden because both animals are used in alchemical and tantric to symbolize the brain, the pineal gland, and the anja chakra. In Vala, we have known root words, Valhalla and Valkyrie. It is now known, as I've suggested before, that the Valhallas were forest halls. They were, in fact, built on mounds, displayed giant dragon heads on each end. These were the dwellings of the Val Aris, the dragon overlords of the forest and beneath them, lying usually in some sort of tomb, were tomb rays. They were the remains of ancestors, the gods of heaven. The Kyrie, sometimes called. Now, the Valhallas were the dwelling places of the gods of heaven and earth, the serpent kings and queens, the great hall on the summit of the mound of the other world was identified or identical to the temple at the peak of a ziggurat. The halls were where the Valkyries, the singers of the gods, assembled. In this capacity, they were sometimes called the brown ravens, meaning that they were still the Morganes, but assumed the magical grail role of the brown turtle doves, the lovers of the phoenix, or the dragon god. Hence, Valhalla is also a variant of the Judaic Magdala, or the house of the doves. The swan serpent caduceus and the descendant dove originate here and in placing the pattern to the grail both symbolize this love of the turtle and the phoenix. The, ser the serpent or sympillion is a swan or serpent necked dove depicted in almost all the medieval architecture. So the link here is pretty clear. The association 
of Lilith with the abyss of the Quiloth and the raven and the dove who symbolize Ishtar. We have another link between Diana and Persephone and a clarification of the nature of Hades. The watery abyss is identified with the Gaelic too. The other world is always reached by water. The masculine nature of the raven is echoed in Machin's alchemical riddle where the serpent eating a serpent becomes a dragon. A serpent who eats its tail makes a circle. It completes itself. It transcends. And a dragon eating a dragon. Transcendent one drinking from the other or from another transcended one. Samuel drinking Lilith becomes a phoenix a raven king, a swan king, or prince, a dragon queen, a raphaim. The phoenix, in its final transcendent glory, becomes a flaming, leaping star, an on, an, or shining one. The nan hash is taught by the raven, or the dove, means that the dry dragon kings drink from the grail priestesses of the abyss or the quillof, the tree of life of the left hand path, the Kula Vama mark, the pool at the foot of Yggdrasil. In the Phoenix and the Turtle by William Shakespeare. There are mentioned the turtle dove, the phoenix, the raven, the swan, and the owl speech, or the screech owl, who is Lilith. It is said that out of the phoenix myth, Shakespeare created, well, it's Shakespeare. We'll talk about who he is again one time. But anyway, Shakespeare created a myth of his own. No, he didn't. It's not so. What he did was expand the myth, fill in its blanks with proper alchemical symbolism, and demonstrate the purpose of the original story, that being the divine union. The, the phoenix of myth, the only bird of its kind, symbolizing the oneness of the all, perceived by those who truly become united with the all, and thus are alone, travels from its eastern paradise and makes a nest of spices. Um, look up the Song of Songs. In an Arabian palm tree, a Sufi symbol, an emblem of the Tamiris, the princesses, read Lily and the Rose again. So having burnt up by its own fire, so consumed in the energy generated by the Anthea, it takes the ashes to the temple of the sun at Heliopolis, lays them on the altar. Other birds, this is ranks of Druidism that I've talked about before, and men gather to rejoice in the chorus, the core. They um, accompanied the singing phoenix as it soars to heaven, returns to its lonely paradise. The word usually is Sam Dahi, Badhisdrava, heaven, transcendence, enlightenment, divine union, also Scythia. So, 
rounding this up, here's the summary. The Transcended Dragon Kings. God, here comes a cop. Transcended Dragon Kings need to drink from the Dragon Princess, a fairy lover. He travels to Arabia, meets his Tamiris, drinks from her nest of spices, and she bestows stillness and ecstasy upon him. He is consumed by fire, or spirit, or combined energy, is reborn, takes his ashes, his mortal body, and lays on the altar of the sun, symbolized by a dragon, a lion, a hawk, and a bull. In Persian, Mithraism. So Mithras, the meditator, or balance, mediator, if you will. To symbolize his achievement of balance, or the nil point, or the zero point and subsequent oneness with the cosmos. Everyone is seriously weirded out that he has managed to regenerate and won't be acting like a complete pillock and ruining everything now that he has refreshed his sovereignty with a living goddess. He can now go back to Scythia, heaven, and carry on reigning and being the wisdom and fertility of the land. End of this story. Shakespeare's virgin, well, version describes beautifully the emotions of Enthia and anyone who has experienced this divine union with another of the blood who will not fail to be deeply moved, both with joy, but also with sadness. Again, this is another Solomic vampire rite, and proof yet again that vampirism is born of love, so deep that it tears the soul from the body as the tale truly suggests. It also implies that the rite has to be repeated and that feeding must be recurrent. The OTO, called the Rite of the Phoenix, the Mass of the Vampire, for good reason. The Phoenix, along with the other birds in Shakespeare's poem called Bennu Birds, and we just finished the year of Bennu, are identified with each other by Druid, by Grant, Magical Revival. And this is because all classes of Druids are vampires and need to feed in order to remain transcendent. The Bennu bird, or bird of return, Bennu means return, symbolizes a being that regenerates or must regenerate itself at regular intervals and the vampire itself bears an at least resemblance that is named after this process in folklore through the vampire always spoken as as one who returns is mistaken for one who returns from the grave instead of one who must return to feed and regenerate. The phoenix is symbolized in Transylvania by the double-headed raven, the brother of Lilith. The bird was adopted by the Hittites and came to symbolize the Holy Roman Empire in the corrupted form of an eagle. This double-headed raven, the phoenix, is a penultimate symbol of the dragon people. In the last process of its generation, 
the phoenix becomes the star, the Anne of the Anunnaki, the elves, the shining ones, the ultimate symbol of the dragon race. So the serpent Nisha, N H S H, in translating the word N H S H, firstly we will take the Hebrew consonants back via Phoenicians to their Sumerian roots. And remember also in Sumeria, syllable groups could be reversed and yet still re render the same meaning in an overall phrase. So the N is Nun, the H hath, as opposed to he. The SH is Shin, as opposed to Sade, or Samoth. We check through the Phoenicians to ensure the continuity of shape, the correct pictographs, pictograms, as we venture back into Sumerian and discover what's next. Nun is Neg, Hath is Ha, Shin is Samunas. Therefore, Hebrew Nahash, we derive the original Sumerian Neg Hasul Munas, Nega Salamuns, or Neg Ha Sal Munas, which translates literally to drink, Neg. Fish, ha, vulva, sam, samunas. Sounds like salmon. Looks like salmon. The fish, it's still fish in the water. It's salmon, right? So it sounds a bit odd. So I'll just explain that a fish is of water. So in Sumerian, the equivalent to our letter A means water. H is the article which stands for of. So Hebrew, NH, SH, SH, of course, the serpent translates into the Sumerian one, dragon. Who drinks of the water, of the vulva? You notice that in this phrase, Neka, Samanun, Uns, two things stand out. First, we have the Aryan word Nega, spelt Nika brings up a lot of words and then we realize that that is not a bad word. Okay. Which would be pronounced as a GH sound. Like nasally. Softly garbled as CH. As in the Scottish word lock. K. Lock. Identical to the Spanish X or G. So it's not really a G, it's more of a K. You have to almost spit it. They speak from their stomach and their throat. Not their throat up, but kind of the stomach up. You know what I mean? Okay. So, according to the Ode, H, with, which in Sumerian was H-A, evoked into the Greek H, Hitha, which was originally pronounced like a KH, pronounced as I've said before, as in Iberian, as in Scythian, as in Gaelic, as K, like lock, or an X. X's were still like a lock. So in this way, we can justify the spelling of nega as nexa.
because X was pronounced in the same way it seems everywhere as soon as they used an X like a lock, like K and then we can begin to understand profound relationship between the Naga, the guardians of the Aryan pathos the Nixas, the Nixas of Western Europe who likewise the female guardians of the watery treasures like the Nagas or the Naxas these were mermaids swan maidens devas the shining ones Ananuga Ananuki again completely same word now the second thing we notice is that the Sumerian word for vulva Semenun uns immediately the poetic connection between the sacred vulva the well of the Nixtan or Nixtan or Nichen the pure one the Nix probably like Nick also means nothing or mixed nothing and the salmon salmon ooze of wisdom that swims in the well should immediately spring to mind it should be the ixos ixulus the vulva of the virgin the Mary Magdalene praise the Lord for the single poetic theme here different stories still talking the same stuff of course washed so it wouldn't be so sexy so in remembering that Sumerian can be reversed we look at the Hebrew NHSH again see if it is reversed as was the custom in Hebrew Kabbalah when the rabbis were tinkering around with language looking for hidden meanings it becomes SH HN Shian the powers further numerical or Germanic value of NHSH in the Kabbalah is 9 which is the number of Yesod, the seraphith of the moon. The Phoenician god was the Sumerian Sin or Shin or Si'an. So the symbols associated with Sin included the axe, the lambrance, which is a device which, as we know, depicts again the vulva the axe symbol prevalent in Mitian and the Minoan culture become the spinning hammer of Thor which is the swastika who as Zeus the wielder of the lightning bolt which in the northern Europe was symbolic of the Norse Sig rune Sig is the lightning bolt of inspiration the mead of inspiration it's the Greek Sigma which is the Hebrew sheen the consonant consonant of N H S H and sin Sumerian God of the moon Sig is the serpentine lightning bolt which curses down the Kabbalic tree of life in a sense, it represents Anki, Samuel, entwined around Lilith. The upturned crescent moon is also said to be associated with Samuel, or Samir, El. And in ancient Sumerian pictures um, produced by Langdon, I think, the moon as a dish is depicted next to the star of Anu below which is the serpent entwined around a tree symbolizing Lilith 
First, we must consider Tiamat. Her name, Ti-a-mat, means water, life, water, maiden. This translates to the maiden of the waters of life. And it is clear that the name indicates she was both known as matriarch and virgin priestess, the feeding mother, the vampire dragon queens and kings, the mother of the Alvin dynasty. She was the generatrix of the vampire lineage of the goddess queens, the god king spanning 7,000 years. She is or was a Neha or the Nixa and from her that Lilith and all the ensuing grail maidens including Sheba Morgana of the apple trees Tamaris Mary Magdalene the priestess of Avalon the Mulusin the Ninin the Ygrain oh their exact words their identifications as trees of life subsequently we say that Tiamat the first Tamiris the maiden who gives the waters of life was also Tiamat Tiamata the first tree mother of the lords and ladies of the forest the druids druid, druidesses the people of the trees of life the younger gods of the Aryans the A Adithias two were Terra and Bagda stand out prominently here because we have Ulick Beck and several other scholars who have traced the origin of the Scythian Irish to Wadadanu Tuatha Denu, the same region as these Aryans, and have gone as far as saying that they were one and the same guys. And interestingly, we find that the goddess Tara, wife of Rudra, Indra's charioteer, appears as Ari, well, in Ari, as Tara the hill or the wraith of ghosts in County Meth Eyrie or Eerie Terra was a sacred center of the United Irish Kingdom and the seat of the Danan kings of Terra during the Iron Age some scholars attribute the name Terra in Aerie to some complicated sounding god name which I find rather implausible in the light of the fact that the goddess Terra already existed in the Scythian Aryan pantheon so whether Asher or Adia or Danan or Millicin of the ancient goddess queens were a source of sovereignty associated with sacred mounds and it seems therefore entirely appropriate to the name Siddith Wrath or Siddhis Wrath a portal to the underworld and thus a source of sovereignty after the goddess who would herself represent sovereignty in the case of Baga or Riga, as his name has been pronounced in Gaelic, scholars think that he became the Slavic god Bog, a word which came to mean God in Thrace, where Danan Fir Bog once existed prior to the return to Ireland. The fear bog, or fur bog, we either have the title of men of God, meaning druids, or we have 
as is commonly thought, men of the bags, which means men of God anyway. Because the bag, specifically the crane skin bag, accessory of the godies and the druids, the men of the gods. So myth or reality here? Considering everything I've said, it's interesting to note Tolkien's Silmarillion. The background mythology supports his Lords of the Rings. We find all these familiar vocabulary words. Etymology that includes the words Einar, Enu, Vala, Mayor, Elder, Ia. Tolkien's words, Aniar means the Holy Ones, of which the singular is Anu. There are two others of these gods in his mythology, the Valar and the Meiar, the plural Aniar and the singular Anu, are clearly derived from the Sumerian father of the gods, Anu and the Anunnaki, whilst Valar appears in all the Aryan pantheon as Vala, the encircler, reminiscent of the Orobus, the alchemical dragon ring that Tolkien wrote so much about. We also remember the Valkyrie at this point. The word Maya, spelt M-A-J-A, in Spanish means a female line of nobility and royalty. The I was originally J and came along with the word majesty. The Latin magis or magis a variant of magi, the magi or the magus from the Greek magos a bloodline member of a castle, a genetic strain, comprised of individuals steeped deep in magic, OED, in other words, the Ari, the Scythian, Dirk Eshia, the dragon goddess of queens, the god kings. And we remember concept of the Dirk Essia and the bloodline of the dragon God Kings the Ashers the Anunnaki in Similarian Maya becomes Maiar it accords with the ancient concept of royalty Maya okay we'll continue this um, in a minute and then we'll take any questions if you have them. FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Trace Elements. We're talking about the Merovingian story, which surprisingly enough goes everywhere on the planet. Believe it or not, I've cut this down so it wouldn't be 45 days long. Because I could have put everyone's myth in there. Oh, again, all listeners supported. We obviously um, are so grateful for everyone's help. It's been uh, incredible for me. You guys know I haven't been feeling well, so um, 
anything I need is ridiculously expensive. You guys have been taking care of me. Love you. Did I tell you guys about the avatars? Yeah, this is going to take a little longer than I thought, isn't it? Okay. God, we've gone through an hour. Do you even believe it? So anyway, I will take questions after this if you want me to go over anything. Okay. So, next. We're talking about the Dirk Ethia. This is still the bloodline of the dragon god kings. The Ashuras and the Anunnaki. In the book Similarian Maya becomes Me'er. It accords with the ancient concept of Deific royalty Maya with an I which related to the manna is the spirit of the gods carried in the blood the attribute of the goddess queen or the god king of the dragon who are in themselves collectively an order of the gods the elves, the shining ones, or gods incarnate, the devas, and the avatars. The spirits of the gods, the ancestors, carried in the blood, we will remember, are the spirits summoned from the deeps, the subconscious, by the witch, vampire, or druid who gains her or his name, the Wicca, Wicca, from the ability to yield or bend to rather than draw to the surface of consciousness, the spiritual intelligence and the wisdoms from her or his ancestral and thus genetic inheritance. In other words, their waking consciousness is pacified or yields to allow the older spirit, the racial memory, the Akasha, the old voice, the field, if you will, to give voice. You yield to the field. Believe it or not, this will all make sense when I go into the stuff happening on the planet. I know, it sounds like, what's she talking about this time? J wait. <laughs> just, one, just one second. So, avatar is a word Tolkien includes in his similarian as eritar, the eight most powerful of his Valar, or the order of the old gods, which seems obvious, were intended to mimic the Egyptian gods of Ogdad, or Ogdod, or the eight Anunnaki who tended the holy mountain after the Black Sea flood. Another of Tolkien's words, similar to Avatar, is Avthar, to him means the shadows which he uses as a name for land near his Bay of Aldemar. Comparing, once again in our world, an avatar is a god made flesh, a dragon king or queen who often occupied tombs and would have been thought of as a shadow, a spirit of the other world, the realm of the shining ones, the ring race. So the Vala and Miar. We have two orders of gods taken from the dragon tradition itself whilst according to the legends of Tolkien's elves the word Eldar became used as a name for three elven kindreds one of which Tolkien named the Vanyar, who appeared to be the Vanir 
gods of the Danes. The cousins of the Duadas, Danu. Tokens, largest variety of the wicked orcs, he named the Uraks, and Urak a city state of the Anunnaki. The orcs, he said, were once the fair elves who had been imprisoned and tortured in the land of Mordor. Eldar, explains Tolkien, became the people of the stars, echoing the traditional Gaelic epitaph for the Tuatha Danu. Also, one of the original meanings of the name Anunnaki, people of the stars, the star people from here. Of men, Tolkien concurs that they are the second younger race of which the elves called the Antani. The Adame, a name, says Tolkien, which later became Adain, obviously the children of Eden. Again, we have a bit of borrowing of the dragon lore where the elves, the children of Anu, the Anukim, the Raphaim of the Old Testament, appeared first, followed by the Adami, or the Ant Antine, as Tolkien would have it, or the Antari, which became a game system. So, the Edain, obviously is Eden. Whilst he uses the Ea as a name for Earth, or Ea, which in Sumerian is a name for the dragon god of the earth and waters. Enki, Samuel, the leader of the elder gods. The Asher, or Asur. Tolkien in his epic works, with their plethora of borrowed names and borrowed linguistics and their elder and younger races, is obviously writing about the family, particularly when he peruses his vocabulary and discovers the name Avalone, a haven, and a city of the Endar, the elves, situated on a lonely isle, Tol Irasa, which was drawn across the ocean, rooted finally in the Bay of Eldamar, adjacent to Avathar, the Island of Shadows, our Avalon, Avalon or Other World. So various names by which our planet, our planet, our parent is known, all stem from the word Eridu, which was first city founded by Enki, Samuel, in Mesopotamia, as a variant of Eridu in the um, Similarian, Tolkien has Edador, and his elven word for Earth is Arda which also derived Eridu. Any questions? <laughs> anyway, same story. We're related. Like it or not, stop being babies to each other. And I have the link to this so you can look up at these names and see how it traveled all over the world. Same names. Same story. Same dragon kings. Same dragon lords. Same wraith ring bearers, same it's the same story it's Garden of Eden it's Anki, it's Enlil it's Amari, it's the waters it's the same story hello there soul food oh and I will put this sorry guys take me a minute I'm going to put this in uh, freedom slips so you can look up these names and see how same story same planet, 
Same goings on. Repeated over and over again. And how even Avatar is a story of the ancients. Story of our fight and our struggle as we continued on the path. So, what's going on now? We have another three First Nations in the far north who have had a horrific time in 2016 killing themselves. We have seen a rash of suicides that are unprecedented. You know, in the hundreds, which is bizarre for for places that only have some of them 2,000 people. What's gone on? It's not like this world has suddenly become crazy. It's not like these reservations have suddenly become concentration camps. They always were. We have some events going on right now that some of us are just more sensitive to, like the earth sounds we've been talking about for the last couple of years. Only a certain percentage can hear them. When you get a group of people that are really closely related, probably have very similar brain chemistries, and most of us don't on this planet, there's also a strange group that have different neurologies. We have names for these people. A lot of them, a lot of them we call that they're autistic. In general, they're just a variant of all of us. Women who have a lot of men in their families with this variant, autism, usually have MS. People with MS and ALS are sensitive, usually to the point that they have cut themselves off from feeling, which is why when you have ALS, which is a very similar thing to MS, your body shuts down quick, turns itself off. Usually your mind functions. This is why Hawkins goes on. You can go on forever if they can continue to pump oxygen in the body. It is interesting because I was listening to Cash today and he pretty much threw us under the bus. <laughs> and people with the ALS and, and uh, MS saying, you know, we can't be helped. We have to decide. We have to decide because for some reason or another... We have detached already, and there's more and more of us. But for women, and you know, I'm in a lot of forums and stuff, I'd like to hear what you say. How many of the men in your family, close relatives, have some sort of autism, whether they've been diagnosed or not? How many of your family are engineers and scientists, researchers specifically. For me, you know, and I've told you before, this was a gift. This illness, which, you know, I suffer from, and this morning I was not thinking it's a gift. I was thinking a whole slew of horrifically inappropriate words. It started with F and CS and, you know, things like that. But I get a chance to use my mind the way I want. There are events going on right now. And I would think more and more of us will be coming attuned to this. We're being changed by earthquakes and infrasound and acoustics. Because the Earth's biggest subwoofer is the earthquakes, which pump ground to produce infrasound. This is changing us. And this year so far has been the most recorded 
meteorite to hit our planet. They too are infrasound. So we are talking about magnetic fields and biology. Touch, taste, sight, smell, hearing. These are senses that connect us with the world. But I would like to say it connects us with more than that. There are more than five senses and researchers are diving into the hidden folds of our brains, discovering that the blind can actually see, that thought can fly across space, and that somehow we have the power to feel the future. Space, time, life itself. And the human brain is a remarkable organ. It contains as many nerve cells as there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Sight, sound, smells, anything happening in our world around us triggers waves of electrical activity that ripple through this vast network in our heads. But this network is interacting and interconnected with the world in ways they don't want us to even try to understand. We are only at the beginning to see what these cells are capable of. Because the brain remains a bioelectric mystery. The sixth sense, the seventh sense, the eighth sense is written off. But remember when you were a kid, if someone looked at when you were doing wrong, and you know you were doing wrong, your mom would know. And you knew she knew. They are studying these things about how emotions travel from person to person. But it's not just person to person. Every day, 24 7. The NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center monitors, sends out space weather alerts, watches, warnings, forecasts about solar and geophysical events that impact satellites, power grids, communications, navigations, other technological systems. What I hope to see any friggin' minute now, and we need this because it's an emergency. And I think most of you who are listening to me right now feel this. Our space weather alerts and watches and warnings sent out to inform the human population of potential health hazards. Unfortunately, most physicians and mental health specialists know nothing about this. Very small changes of activity in the Earth's magnetic field due to alterations in solar activity can affect all human beings. And right now, when we have every single planet in this solar system freaking the hell out, we're being affected. And these are direct effects. They're primarily upon the subtle, complex electromagnetic fields that interact with everyone's consciousness. Due to marked similarities of characteristics of our brain and, like it or not, genetic history. And the closer our genetic history it is, the more people react in groups solar activity, but we're also getting activity from far off solar objects. It can change consciousness. They don't tell us about it, but it absolutely can. And people with health issues, depression, neurological disorders, cardiovascular, stroke patients, those wearing pacemakers, etc., should especially pay attention to the space 
weather forecast because there is a large number of studies that have identified significant physical, biological, health, health effects associated with change in solar and geomagnetic activity. Variations in solar activity, geomagnetic activity, isospheric ion electron concentrations are highly correlated and strongly linked with geophysical processes. They want to act like we are not connected, but that absolutely is a lie. We are. And a leading earthquake scientist warned 10 years ago that the planet is cracking up after a series of massive quakes. And this is happening right now. 39 quakes hit the globe within two days. A series started two massive quakes, especially in Indonesia, measuring 8.6 and 8.2 on the Richter scale, rapidly followed by three more, only slightly smaller, in Mexico within hours. There is no doubt that something is seriously wrong here. There have been too many strong earthquakes. The quakes are a surprise that cannot be easily explained by what they're telling us. With the Indonesian quake, statistically, there should be one big earthquake in this part of Asia every 500 years. However, since 2004, there have already been three earthquakes with a magnitude over eight. That is not normal. Now, we know for a fact that there is a magnetic reversal going on. This is not speculation. It's happening. Now, the Earth's magnetic poles have been shifting for quite some time compass direction, the true north is parting ways. Earth's magnetic north and south poles have flipped flopped many times in our planet's history. Most recently though around 780,000 years ago. Geophysicists who study the magnetic field have long thought that the poles are getting ready to shift again. And based on all the new data it's happened way earlier than anyone thought. Now, a few years ago, around 2000, a scientist of Canada went out there grabbing his gloves and his parka and his fancy, fancy compass, hopped on a plane, flew over the Canadian Arctic, and not much stirs amongst these scattered islands, the sea ice. But there is something moving, shifting, elusive. This is the Earth's north, the magnetic pole. In 2003, it was located, located in northern Canada about 600 kilometers from the nearest town, which is Resolute Bay, population 300 of the toughest people on this freaking planet, because that's too far up north. As a matter of fact, I saw this cutest t-shirt. It only has a population of a 300. The saying, Resolute North isn't the end of the world, but you can see it from here. Now the movement of Earth's North Magnetic Pole across the Canadian Arctic started around 1631. 
they've known about this for a long time. They've stopped giving data, but other than theories of what's happening next, it's moving faster. Much, much faster. As a matter of fact, the magnetic north is now actually south. The two converging points are moving around the Philippines, basically, where they are going to converge. The shift has been incredible. The speed in which this is happening, it's jumping. So when I see quakes and eruptions, especially the deep eruptions that are happening in the ocean, it's fairly obvious to me we're not waiting for the change. It's happening. This planet is changing before our eyes. These shifts, especially with the earthquakes, the deep water earthquakes, these strange sounds that only some people can see, the anomalous snow in Mexico. First snow for, I think one more was recorded about a hundred years ago. There's a reason that the Russians are making a satellite that could become the second brightest object in the solar system next to the sun. Magnetic storms. These features. Talk about a changing earth. Because the sun giveth and changes. And, you know, taketh away. Sort of thing. Now, cardiovascular problems. Monthly death number linked to cosmic activity. And the inverse to solar activity because our sun is quiet. Way too quiet. We were supposed to have gone to a solar maximum. We did not. Central place of stroke related deaths is emerging. And it all has to do with solar activity. Cellular damage which we are experiencing right now and during the past decades many many studies have been published concerning cosmo terrestrial influences on different parts of the human homeostasis we like to stay around certain temperature around a certain amount of things we have a nice little comfy fat zone but the cosmic ray activity predominant even in plaque disruption, cellular damage, electrical instability, the activation, the coalition, the coagulation, the inflammation. There is an increasing amount of evidence linking biological effects to solar and geomagnetic disturbances. A series published on referring to the changes in responses to the different levels here. Heart attacks. And the suicide data? The suicide data is is monumental. Since we're only in March and what's happened in Canada, especially what's happened to men. Now suicide data and a lot of this is related to where they, the holes are, like over Canada, over, um, I think it's around either New Zealand or um, Australia right now, but there's quite a few of the holes because there's just such a shutdown going on. There's a big problem. The death figures where suicide has been connected 
as a cause of death? Total number, 100%, 51,000, well, 52,000 males, 16,000 females included. Average number of suicides greatest in the spring for males and females. And within the last couple of weeks, it's skyrocketed here in Canada. I have links. The, there have been northern um, reserves calling a state of emergency because there's been so many suicides. And this is lately. This is within the last three weeks. And I'm telling you, it's been mild here. Hugely mild. Unprecedentedly mild. Up north, they usually have re very isolating winters. You can't get out. The weather's crap. You got snow. That's all you got. Nothing else explains the suicides. Nothing else. You know, it's lowest in autumn suicides for males in general. The suicide amongst females increased significantly in autumn during concurrent periods of solar storm activity. Pattern is different in men. Ambient electromagnetic field activity impact behavior in a clinically meaningful manner. Studies furthermore raise issues concerning the sources of stray electromagnetic fields, their effects on mental health. We are seeing this. It's not imagination. And we also feel each other. You know, in a healthy brain, a complex symphony of signals flows from the eye to a region called the visual cortex. But if the visual cortex is damaged by stroke, signals or, you know, whatever damages it, signals no longer can be picked up. You should think all knowledge of what's going on is ended. Stroke normally affects one side of the cortex. Not always, but usually. If you take a person with damage like this, use a partition to separate what the person's blind eye sees and functioning I sees show images of happy, sad, angry faces to one side only. An image of someone laughing, someone expressing joy. You see that a face actually starts intimidating when they can't see the image. You use the same muscles without knowing it. If you see a smile, you make a smile, whether you see a smile or not. What's remarkable here is that emotional faces shown only to a patient's blind eye. People imitate the emotions that their blind eye sees. The response is not a conscious one. You're not guessing. You do it automatically. The blind sight, it's called, deeply buried subconscious sensory system rooted in a hidden part of the brain that receives signals from the eyes only though when an image is loaded with emotion we are tapping into the deepest levels of the brain so 
What's it built on? What are these lower ancient layers? Facial expressions. I think this is our ancient pre-language knowing. This is why I've always said before language there was something else. Normally information from the eyes travels down the optic nerve directly into the visual cortex. But when eyes are looking at human emotions, signals diverge from that path. They travel to the um, amygdala, <laughs> interesting word, the superior um, the colossus, is that how you say it? And six and other structures in the brain, basically. The human visual system can six actually of nine, at least, different pathways. Only one of those we begin to understand, and the eight others are completely in the background. So it's only in the case where one needs to be sidestepped that the alternative pathways have a chance, but they are built in checkpoints. Because knowing emotion is so important. Subconscious mental pathways that apparently from the testing see nothing else other than emotional. Because the emotional pathway is so important. And we all have these pathways, even though they are normally overwhelmed by our primary sense of sight. It is the first time scientific evidence of a new sense beyond the five is absolutely proven. That we actually have a sympathetic ear, too, to noises that we should not be able to hear. The brains can sense things when we are not aware of them. We can hear what can't be heard. This is why some of the people on this planet are hearing the earth sounds. You can't consciously hear them. Our ears don't work with this. Except there are pathways in our brain that tell us something is going on. Not everyone. But I think we're changing fast enough that everyone will hear them. Consciousness is subjective. Science is objective. In just the last couple of decades, though really, scientists have started coming back to consciousness as a problem in its own right because it is layers and layers constructed from the data our senses are gathering. We are getting a huge amount of input whether we know it or not. If we lose one sense we must have fail-safes. It is the only way it could be. We need to know what someone else is feeling. It's so important that we sense it without eyes. We see it without eyes. So aren't we not seeing and hearing and feeling what's happening on every other planet in this solar system? Some things may be the focus of your consciousness. They grab your attention. They don't let go. But how we discover what we are missing. Why there's only certain neural activity managed to find its way to our awareness. Even though it's happening. It's a lie that half the brain shuts off. It doesn't. What's actually happening in our brains. When we are conscious of something. Is a complete mystery. One of the basic questions here about consciousness is whether you can explain it in terms of a physical process. Because you've got no idea, not in science, 
that you start with a few basics in history or physics or space, time, matter. Put them together. They say you can explain everything else, chemistry, biology, but it's a lie. They can't. If I smile or scowl, my thoughts cross the room. A neurologist would say it's just a pattern of electrical activity inside my brain. But it's deeper than that. Because not only do you know if I'm smiling or not, you know it. We've been taught not to know it. But we do. Like it or not. We also know there is a place that human thoughts merge into a conscious collective. And this spans across the globe. It lives in the real world. The touch is very light, but to the degree that it's a real touch, it's extremely important. Most don't still today don't believe it's possible. Research shows it happens. And this phenomenon, strange, has been reported by many other researchers. They have noticed that readouts of electronic devices, especially ones I've talked about before, random number generators, are affected by people sitting next to them. If those people focus their thoughts on them. In the course of a long series of experiments over years, they have found people can change the behavior of numbers, random or otherwise. These are generators, electronic. Instead of heads or tails, they throw out ones or zeros. Is that supposed to be random? But they are not. And there is a place called the Global Consciousness Project. They are looking at these things. We react when an earthquake is coming. Not all of us, not every time, but more and more of us. Some of us, especially with neurological illnesses, neuropathy, phantom pain, stuff they call fibromyalgia right now, are reacting to something. There's a reason why I've been so sick, especially since December. This planet is changing. I'm reacting to it. It actually makes me feel much, much better knowing it's not from the skyhooks. So, things like Obama's victory speech, people on this planet reacted. It looked like the world was about to change, that we had suddenly opened up. But you see the elections right now, they are throwing more one side against another side. They are doing the whole poll thing again. White versus black, cops versus robbers, you know. They're playing right into their hands. That's all I'm going to say about it, Trump. You see what you see. But this is the morphic field. And it's generated by all living things. Fields are just range and regions of influence. It's easy to see what fields are with magnetic fields. Little magnets. Thing 
things that attract each other, push each other away. But there is a self-organizing property in fields. They're inherently integrative. So this morphic field which actually organizes the bodies of animals and plants and organizes activities of brains, minds. These are the things that allow birds to fly in perfect formation. What guide the mass migrations of herd animals? The reason we get an uncanny feeling when someone stares at us. It's why birds not only fly in unison, sometimes they make shapes of animals, especially animals whose feelings are intense. We have these same magnetic abilities. This sense is real. You are not imagining something is odd right now. Something is off. We're feeling it. And if you know anyone who has autism or some sort of neurological variant, you will notice that they feel off right now. They're expressing that they feel stressed. But listen, if you yourself try it, try the test. Think of a person who you love, who loves you. Think of that person's name. See if you can mention, get them to call you. If you can't, if they're in the room, they're turned away, you look at them, think their name in their head, they will turn. Do a test. Look at the ground. See if they call you. Look at them in your head, say their name. See what it does. Now, people know they are being stared at. We've talked about, well, interviewed even a couple. People who are security guards looking at people through a camera. If you look at someone when they're about to steal, nine times out of ten, they will put the thing back and not do it because we know we're being looked at. Now think about us walking through the forest. We need to know if there is something stalking us. Yes? So of course it's, an, it's not a smile or anything but it's an intent. We need to know that intent. There needs to be something that works more than hearing. Something that works more than smell. Something that works more than sight. We need eyes in the back of our heads, right? <laughs> this is the morphic field. It is an invisible, invisible extension of ourselves. So what I'm suggesting is that our minds work through extended fields that stretch far out beyond our heads into the world around us into maybe even the very solar system and beyond, linking us to other people and to our environment. In a lab that I've told you about in Sudbury, Ontario, researcher has proved this, that thoughts fly from one mind to another. Every minute of every day that we are surrounded by an invisible force. The force is with us. The world is wrapped in a magnetic field. Your head is wrapped in a magnetic field. Your heart is wrapped in a magnetic field. As a matter of fact, science can't even explain how your heartbeat does not crack your ribs open. But for the creatures on the earth, Life would be impossible without the field. Birds, sea turtles, fish rely on this magnetic, global magnetism to navigate. So when we are seeing herds 
of animals washing up on shore at the same time, there is a problem. Our minds are using this. You can call this the root of the sixth sense if you want, but it's absolutely proven. The powerful effect of Earth's magnetic field on animals proven a long time ago. Animals use something like a third dimensional magnetic field of the Earth as the navigation system, the homing device. There's evidence to this. It's, I would say, proven. Some scientists still argue, but I would call them idiots. So, seven billion of us and more linked into the same thing. It's not an accident. We'll go into this more next week. Um, thank you very much for listening, and have a nice weekend, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this today. Bye for now.